well. Hope that's all right. And I'm gonna, once you see your slides on the screen, I hope I have the right slides now. It's been a bit back and forth, but um, I'm gonna press um, the timer. So when you hear the timer rings, your three minutes are done. And we appreciate if you round off there. And it's tricky. You don't have to feel like you have to say everything. You'll have plenty of time to discuss this further together in other sessions. But give an overview and what do you think other projects are interested in hearing from you in these three minutes. Uh, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see how this goes. And now you can see the right mode, I hope. Tell me otherwise. Yep. Yep, thank you. And so let's start with City Food then. Welcome. Yep, I can take over. Yes. Do you uh, go forward with the slides or yep. do I have to make something? Just tell me next. So. Okay. Uh, so welcome everybody. Thank you for having me here, or for having us here. Uh, we are from the City Food team. When we thought about uh, smart uh, development, smart integrated development, and sustainable development of cities uh, in the food, water, energy context, what came in, in mind is producing food in a very sustainable way. And we oriented towards the uh, aquaponics approach uh, because this uh, inherits, uh, in principle, circular reusage of water and nutrients already and seemed to be appropriate for this thing. Next slide, please. Yes, so we formed a project up with. Uh, six project partners and meanwhile towards the end of the the project more than 10 associated and cooperated partners consisting of uh, six work packages and going from uh, knowledge uh, gain knowledge collection not then then developing into a knowledge distribution modeling approaches living lab approaches and finally the dissemination uh, of all the gained uh, experiences. Next slide. Yeah, the most promising results are four running living labs that will continue to work over the next years at least, next 10 or 15 years, I hope. More than 60 uh, scientific publications and a lot of uh, common publications too one open access book about aquaponics food production with 1.2 million downloads, a city food knowledge base that is an interactive web page, which is still ongoing in development and will even consist over a long time, we hope. Some follow-up projects and naturally a lot of meetings, conferences and so on with cooperating partners, policy stakeholders, children, pupils, students and so on. Next slide, please. The impact uh, considered first technological or the most important impacts considered mostly uh, first technological aspects. That means the modeling made it possible to uh, propose ideal or uh, optimized internal and external material energy and information flows designing and planning and operation of aquaponics facilities. Then we evaluated env environmental effects. That means how to uh, get to the lowest environmental impact by this. And we even evaluated the economic effects. Is this uh, inside a city in as a food delivery uh, sustainable, viable over long time, even from economical side? Next slide, please. Hey, three minutes have passed. Oh, and uh, yes, uh, the the impact was also uh, on planning planning inspect aspects that we reconsidered 
and societal impacts uh, were uh, uh, touched by urban living labs, integration of producers and the knowledge base, as I already said. So thank you, that's it. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm happy as an urban living labs bit of nerd, I'm happy to hear that the living labs will continue in some form. Was that right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So we have we have uh, one living lab or two, one living lab that is running at the university. So it's mainly research and education of students in Brazil, and this will, will continue as well. Then we have two living labs in Norway. Uh, one is not uh, totally finished, but in the first steps of producing, and one is already producing in prisons. Mm -hmm. So that will be an ever-living one, because their uh, prisoners, uh, inmates are schooled and can make their education for a later uh, life and even feed themselves or get mm -hmm. themselves some mm -hmm. uh, healthy food. And one is here in, in Berlin uh, for education of children and pupils in a drama, in a children education center. Wow, very different uh, groups adopting yep. this. Yeah, mm -hmm. super. Let's talk more about it uh, a bit later, maybe. Yep. Yes. Okay, is it few meter? Yeah. There you are, Lydia. Hi. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Uh, in our Fumeter project for the analysis of the food, water, energy nexus, we use the concept of urban metabolism. And the subject of our research interest were small urban agriculture projects, which, unlike conventional agriculture, have not been thoroughly researched so far and are a vital element of the urban fabric uh, in many cities. In five countries, France, uh, Germany, Poland, the UK, and the United States, we analyzed 74 case studies, mainly collective gardens, urban farms, and individual gardens, where we collected data to quantify inputs and outputs of the system over two growing season, seasons in uh, 2019 and 2020. Next slide, please. And uh, noting the importance of the human factor uh, in this system, we extend the nexus to the fourth element, people, promoting the food, water, energy, people nexus approach. Um, it is the human being with his knowledge, experience, and skills who is the driving force and a significant beneficiary in this uh, system. By influencing the behavior of gardeners and farmers and by recommendations for policymakers, we can shift urban agriculture towards a more resource efficient and sustainable one. Next, please. Uh, based on our uh, project results, we find that mainly organic fertilizers are used for crops, and one of them is compost produced on site from green waste uh, from the garden. The soil quality is good, and its uh, test did not show any exceeding of the norms for the content of toxic uh, heavy metals, so keep, keep it up. Uh, but we noticed that there is still a small amount of rainwater uh, accumulating and using it for watering crops. Uh, gardens mainly use municipal water, so here is a space for um, changes. Garden infrastructure such uh, rice beds, huts, greenhouses and fencing used especially on individual gardens. Uh, mean that these small agricultural interventions have a more significant environmental impact than conventional uh, farming. The carbon footprint is lower if the gardens use uh, reusable or recycled materials. When planning urban farms, uh, areas in, um, in the city, policymakers should take into account that such areas should exist as long term and not temporary or transitional because infrastructure must have a minimum lifespan of 10 years for an urban farm to have similar environmental impact to a conventional farm. Next uh, slide, please. We haven't stopped yet. 
In parallel with the data analysis, we organized two international webinars for gardeners and policymakers. We have engaged um, various scientific approaches to research, such as cost-benefit analysis and life cycle assessment to learn more about the environmental impact of urban gardening and its benefits for uh, for people. Uh, we are preparing a final report for practitioners and a roadmap for policymakers. Uh, although the project is nearing completion, we are still preparing articles for publication as we have a huge um, database with uh, uh, more than uh, uh, 35,000 of entries uh, still to use. Thank you very much. Thank you. Super timely, too. Um, okay, we're moving forward and we'll discuss a bit later. Thank you, Glowcool. Oh, no, few meter. And now we move to Glowcool. I never learned how to say this properly. I'm very sorry. <laughs> you, can, Hi, hello. you can correct me. Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm Joop de Kraker. That's how you pronounce my name. Thank um, you. The project name is GLOCAL and it stands for Globally and Locally Sustainable Food, Water, Energy Innovation in Urban Living Labs. Great. Next. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go back to the original uh, project proposal where we formulated two main aims of the GLOCAL project. The first was to develop a co-creative urban living lab approach for innovations in the food water energy nexus that are both globally and locally sustainable. So it's about developing really sustainable innovations and doing that together in a participatory way involving users and other stakeholders. The next aim was to develop a toolkit to support this participatory innovation assessment approach. Next slide. And that brings me to the key outcome of the project on which I will focus the Food, Water, Energy, Nexus Innovation Toolkit. As we, in the course of the project discovered, uh, was that awareness of the Nexus is virtually non-existent in practice. As it was already in the introduction mentioned, um, city administrations, urban management, etc., is organized in a sectoral silo type of way. So um, it became clear that in this toolkit, we had to start at the very basics with a module that created awareness of the nexus in the first place, for all these sectoral practitioners from food, water, and energy. And then in the second module, uh, we go one step further and we give them tools, very simple qualitative tools to explore their food, water, energy nexus system in their particular case. Look at the cross sector impacts, look at the cross scale impact. So at the urban scale and beyond. And then in the third module, that's where the real assessment comes in, where you have simple quantitative tools like spreadsheets, where an innovation can be compared to the existing situation or another, sorry, my timer. Thank you. <laughs> um, so in the, in the third module, uh, a simple spreadsheet can be used to compare a proposed innovation with the existing situation or another innovation and see which is more sustainable, both locally and globally. Thank you. Super, and thank you for helping keeping the time. You're welcome. We're moving on to InSource. We have Volker there. Yes, right? yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, let's um, 
give a quick introduction to InSource, which stands for Integrated Analysis of Modeling for the Management of Sustainable Food, Water and Energy Resources. Next slide, please. So um, as I think you oops, start, was saying, yeah, thank you, that's good. We started with, not with, with um, sharing tools, but with requirement analysis together with the stakeholders, but using, um, of course, um, tools as well, especially um, the causal loop diagrams that was introduced by one of the project partners that turned out to be quite valuable for this requirements analysis, because my impression was that the, um, for example, city administration, the food for the energy dependencies are in a way clear and they are aware of it, but they don't know how to deal with them because of the, the structure of the, yeah, it's the same as that silo structure. And this tool um, was great um, help to visualize the, the connections between the different um, sectors. And that was, um, I would say quite successful um, at the time where <laughs> you could meet in a room. <laughs> um, it was more difficult than in online meetings, I have to, to admit. It. Yeah, but at the beginning was very, very useful. Um, next slide, please. So based on these requirements that we did in different case studies in the city of Vienna and city of New York, where we had a big um, urban, um, yeah, urban district development project and um, was a state or county of Ludwigsburg in Germany, um, where we have a large yeah, mixed urban and um, rural area. Um, we developed a data model that was our focus here in this um, project to have an integrated um, data model to be able to um, have a common database for the food, water, energy nexus. So based on the requirements, we came up with a so-called CityGML um, food, water, energy application domain extension, which is basically an extension of existing data models, integration of existing data models um, with focus on the different aspects. Um, next slide, please. Uh, with this data model, um, we populated with data, of course, and applied this data model and built um, tools, simulation tools um, for different aspects of the food, water, energy nexus, all using, or well, that was the idea, the, the same um, data, integrated data sets in, um, in this case, for, for example, you see the picture, um, upper left from my perspective at least, um, the um, bioenergy um, potential at the um, county of Ludwigsburg. We did similar analysis on water demand, similar analysis on energy demand, so all aspects. And they are um, using all the same tools and the same um, data, integrate database, so you can connect the results and see conflicts. And that is, I think was, was one of the big um, values that if you optimize, or usually if you optimize um, the energy production, you use more agricultural and for energy production like um, PV, um, open space PV, and others use the same land for to optimize uh, the food production, for example, yeah? and then you have conflicts. And with tools, we can't solve the conflicts, but we can raise awareness. And, yeah. um, and that, that was the, the, the idea um, behind this. And we did this also for a city district in city of Vienna with a similar idea, also with one tool from AIT that is doing a, a forecast of changes in land use, uh, which is also an, an very important aspect, I think, because we do the planning for the future, not for the current situation. So land use will change, climate will change, etc. And the, the, the last thing was the use case in, in governance, which was more um, a district planning application. Yeah, but we evaluated all the, 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 the different um, these urban designs um, by using our tools. Thank you. Yeah, that's an overview. Thank you. And <laughs>
Yes. Okay. Uh, Jose, if one, are you there? <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you, Caroline, Jose. Um, we are our name of project understanding innovative initiatives for governing food, water, energy nexus in city. You are a group of seven uh, partners in the consortium from all continents, uh, Americas, Africa, Europe, and Asia. And, and you're funded by uh, the respective organizations where your countries are and have also institutional support of different uh, 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 organizations. No? Can you go to the next slide? We have like three objectives and uh, in the, since the beginning, you didn't uh, change the objective or are not urban labs. What you did is you tried to understand uh, food, water, energy nexus using a green and blue infrastructure for existing projects. Uh, the idea was to try to see how those projects work and, and to, to understand how we can make them work, you know, like have interventions based on existing initiatives. You know? And for these, you did a, a literature review. Uh, I also did a survey in eight two cities, how they did it you, for innovative initiatives that you detected in those cities. And the cities are all from the, the South, have global South, developing countries. And also we have more in-depth studies in, in, in 10 cities uh, in, in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And with this, you, you kind of understood how is the current situation of uh, uh, use of uh, green blue infrastructure in the nexus and impacts on the nexus. Go to the next, please. Based on these, you created a framework to explain how cities uh, develop institutions and gain capabilities. You know, our understanding is try to uh, did a lot of interviews with city managers, stakeholders, and also based on survey, you 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 detected that a lot of uh, uh, cities they actually rely a lot on uh, different kind of what call learning mechanisms that they learn internally internal process of learning, you know, city in itself interact with different departments, for example, or training, and also external mechanisms. I mean, mechanisms that uh, come from organizations from outside the, the city government, you know, the local institutions in the private sector, civil society, but also others. And then you develop these models, acquisition, translation of knowledge and dissemination. And these uh, uh, go to the next, please. And once you have this uh, next slide, oh, it's missing one slide, the, the third one. Oh, okay. You don't have it another one? No, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, cut one slide. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, 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 but our uh, Next slide will be basically based on that. You develop a, a guide, a guidebook, and this guidebook uh, uh, basically how to cities to uh, accelerate innovations in Nexus using green blue infrastructure. And this guide, you have used it with the cities participate in our uh, uh, research, you know, the 10 cities, but we also had a training workshop with eight sessions with uh, around 30 cities from uh, around the world. And, and also we disseminate this guide, uh, uh, revise it and going to disseminate in different events, for example, World Urban Forum and the, the, the CBD COP, you know, the Convention of Biological Diversity, ECLA World Congress uh, next month, and you kind of disseminate this guidebook that cities could see step by step how they, they, do, they accelerate innovations for, for next. Sorry, it was in the other slide, but this was the third objective, disseminate these ideas to cities mm. within our research group and beyond. That's it, thank you. Thank you. It's very impressive how you involved many cities and quite deeply too with these interviews with city managers. Did they, did they also speak in terms of the food, water, energy nexus or were they rather using the green blue infrastructure terms and so on 
Yeah, the, the nexus, as you saw in the in the previous presentation, is not established concept for yeah. policy. It is, but they, they see this in this integration. People see, you know, when they develop projects for food, for example, there are some impacts on, on water and energy. Also, when they develop some uh, water uh, initiatives, they are related to sometimes to, to, to food and energy, and it, they see those relations. Uh, and, it, it, uh, and, and many of these impacts were not intentional. You know, they didn't do these, but they realized this happened afterwards. No? Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that counts too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, we move to urbanizing in place. Chiara? Chiara? Hi, good afternoon. So my hi. Name is, uh, hi, I'm Chiara Tornaghi from the Urbanizing in Place project, uh, resourcing the food, water, energy nexus from below. Uh, next slide, please. So our project was ambitious um, and targeting many of the EU urban agenda themes, uh, despite encountering uh, several uh, obstacles that limited our empirical work. Uh, our results are far ranging and uh, include uh, conceptual models, uh, assessment of business demand, policy briefs and examples of policy implementation. Uh, next slide, please. So water and energy consumption uh, in the production of food are largely related to soil fertilizers, soil irrigation and soil tilling. Uh, however, many food, water, energy nexus debates tend to overlook soils. Um, the first results of our project uh, is a deeper understanding of the nexus based on agroecology as a metabolic practice. Uh, an approach to food cultivation whose pillars are resource conservation, um, biocultural diversity, more than human solidarities, and crucially, soil care. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a second key result is uh, the understanding of how to expand the metabolic agency of farmers. Uh, we identified uh, the specific barriers they face, for example, due to farmland fragmentation, uh, the loss of other farmers in the area, uh, planning legislation, or the location and type of urban organic waste. And uh, we identify specific demands for public service provision or for business development and of the range of innovative practices and examples. Next slide. Uh, building on this work, uh, we have achieved good impact by contributing to policy development and policy implementation. In London and Riga, we have contributed to catalyze interest for urban agroecology and peri-urban fringe farming with key actors. Uh, in Brussels, we were pivotal in ensuring a political commitment of the Brussels capital region uh, to implement the Center for Urban Agroecology. And in Rosario, our projects contributed to shape uh, three municipal ordinances uh, for the support of agroecological farmers including the provision of energy efficient infrastructure, the access to urban waste and the mentoring for agroecological transitions. Next. Um, the policy pathways and business opportunities and best practices identified in the project are organized around eight building blocks uh, or areas of articulation of a new model of sustainable urbanization that we named agroecological urbanism. Uh, we have prepared a policy brief specifically targeting UN habitats. This is currently with our editor. And next slide. Uh, however, we are completing an online incubator for an agroecological urbanism with dissemination materials prepared and co-designed with practitioners, including comic strips, uh, illustrated posters and video clips to enable a wider uptake of our project results and support uh, political work in each context and beyond. And next, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and how come you uh, targeted you and Habitat in your policy brief? How did that come? Well, we have realized that UN Habitat is framing debates and uh, trickling down as well also to different level of government ideas of urban development and uh, and we have realized that there is a very deep silos working so the main idea of of, uh, of vision for the future is also metropolitan expansion 
and the, the definition of uh, you know of, of rural context as mostly mechanized and and uh, kind of normalizing the population loss so, mm -hmm. so that is very important to think how to frame uh, how to support with infrastructure uh, appropriate infrastructure urban and peri-urban uh, and rural context in order to enable farmers to remain in those contexts not to migrate to urban context because they can't operate anymore as farmers right. uh, so so that is very important that um UN Habitat is embracing agroecology as a, and soil protection as a driving principle in developing ideas of development. Mm. Very interesting, thank you. Okay, our last project to present, but not least, uh, Vertical Green and Karin Hoffman. And after that, we uh, can have some comments, questions, reflections from all of you. You can just raise your hand if you wanna share something. So Karin. Yes, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so yeah, I'm Karin Hoffmann and I'm from the project Vertical Green 2.0. Um, the full title of our project is Vertical Greening for Livable Cities, Co-Create Innovation for the Breakthrough of an Old Concept. And actually on this first slide, you can already see the vision that we had at the beginning of our project, which is to turn highly urbanized and um, highly sealed urban areas into the greener and healthier environments. And the main question in our interdisciplinary team was, why is a concept as vertical greenery that you can find in different cities already not more established, even though vertical green has um, numerous benefits? Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. Yeah, during the project, we followed uh, the co-creation approach. We had a number of stakeholder workshops. We had a future scenarios workshop where we um, were developing uh, visions of key stakeholders and their ideas of the future of implementation of vertical greenery. We uh, conducted a constellation analysis, expert interviews and surveys where we identified the key stakeholders we, want, uh, we had to address and to find out what are their needs and um, in their view, the obstacles and challenges, but also opportunities for vertical green. And next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Um, yes, our innovations or our results. Um, well, we, we just finished our project, I have to say first, maybe um, our project finished in end of January of this year. Mm -hmm. As we are such a diverse group, our results range um, from demonstrators that we established in Vienna and in Berlin. On the upper left side, you see a vertical greenery system in Vienna, and on the lower right side, you see the system in Berlin. We have um, models, and you see the output of an energy saving uh, of a model that you can use for calculating the energy saving potential of vertical greenery. Another one can be used for identifying priorities of um, the cities for implementation. And we also, or one part of our group, also uh, developed a harvesting robot prototype. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, um, from this project, uh, a number of follow up projects have, um, have derived. And only at, at TU Berlin, we had four projects that came out of Vertical Green 2.0, and two of them are dealing also with the establish, with, with establishing urban living labs. Um, another one is establishing, uh, wants to implement uh, Vertical Green in different schools and um, integrate it in the school curriculum. And another one is, um, is, uh, is uh, working on methods that can be used in future regulations and norms. Um, next slide, please. Um, we have a number of publications that I'm inviting you to, to, um, to have a look at where we are. Um, this is just a selection of, of some publications, some scientific publications. And I especially want to point out that we are currently uh, working on a final summarizing pro uh, project publication that will be an ebook, and it's going to be free and open access, and it's going to be published in the upcoming months. And yeah, please reach out to us for any further information. Next slide, please. Yeah, these are our contact information. Thank you very much.
Super, thank you. What, how interesting to work with uh, vertical greening in Berlin and Taiwan. It must be very different places to be in, do this. That's true. Well, I have to say the, the core cities that have, we've been working in have been Berlin, Vienna, and Ljubljana. Um, our partners from Taiwan have, have focused mainly on the robotic solutions. Um, but yes, it has been very interesting to, to exchange on that. Of Thank you, everyone. Questions, comments, reflections from everyone else. We have Laura, you raised your hand. Hello, everybody. Good morning. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened to my camera. Probably something to do with the, um, with the antivirus system here. Well, well, what I'd like to know, we worked uh, with mostly with uh, developing country cities and in our research on green and blue infrastructure, we noticed uh, some differences between developed and developing country cities. So I'd like to know uh, in the case of uh, the other projects that involved cities from um, developing and uh, developed countries, if they did anything in terms of comparing results or methodologies or um, anyway, is, uh, was there a difference that was significant in terms of the project results? Thank you. Anybody? Especially local and I'm sorry, I forget the name of the, um, the other projects that involved developing countries too. Okay, I'm from Glocal, so I can respond. Uh, I think it's, a, you. it's an interesting question. Um, well, what, what I found was that the Nexus concept was actually um, welcomed more in, in uh, developing countries than in, in, in European cities. Um, in European cities, there was not much interest in the uh, Nexus concept, mm -hmm. um, which has to do with uh, two things. First of all, um, a much more popular concept, which has to do with European policy is circularity. So um, policymakers and practitioners were uh, more thinking in terms of circularity than in terms of, of a nexus. And of course, yeah, you could, you could connect with that, but then you sort of had to translate. Uh, and the other was that um, the nexus approach was um, considered to be a sort of step back from a more integrated um, sustainable development approach where you would combine uh, not only uh, food, water and energy, but also other aspects like, uh, let's say, uh, mobility, for example. Um, but, but in our uh, ci the cities that, that uh, were included from the Global South, um, which was Sao Paulo and, uh, and Cape Town, uh, their uh, policymakers were much more interested in this nexus concept, interestingly. Thank you. We have. Thank you. <laughs> we have a few Sorry. minutes left, but don't worry, you'll have plenty of time to discuss uh, also in the other sessions. Uh, Laura, you raised your hand there. You talked, yes, Ernst? Yes, but I was not first. I think it was. Laura before, but well, anyway, I could, my question, because you mentioned you have to leave the room, no, in 52 seconds. Uh, my question would be about um, the urban um, green uh, is increasing almost because of climate changes and to adapt to this, no, but what is the experience of the partners vertical green, for example, to produce food also in these vertical green areas, because this is not that common and in, in Vienna we have a lot of agricultural area in a city but we have to battle and we have to fight for this to keep no because they want to change it to green areas but not to producing food super we're gonna close the room in a few seconds don't forget to use the chat and you will be able to speak again soon so take note who you'd like to talk more to and you can find each other in the other sessions too thank you everyone supporting cities to use the nexus approach particularly using green blue infrastructure uh, the first objective we're going to talk at, at how you achieve it 
uh, understand innovation in food, water, energy nexus using green and blue infrastructure. The first is our definition is green and blue infrastructure for us is interconnected network of a wide range of living landscape. Innovation section would be very helpful or even necessary for assessing the contribution of the project. Um, in our opinion, the projects have we asked, okay, how could this be utilized and also scaled up in future projects? Awareness with focus on energy because we are in a energy center here in, in, in Vietnam. Third project, Vertical Green 2.0, that um, actually is looking at uh, designing and interpreting. Internal, they generate more incremental innovation. You know? uh, and, and based on that, you, you start disseminating these guidelines, you develop a guidebook, uh, and also start sharing knowledge among cities itself in our, uh, our group, but also cities are interested in this, and, and, and we have uh, develop this guidebook that uh, you are now revising it to have the final version uh, and step by step on how to develop capabilities to innovate uh, in green blue infrastructure for Nexus. And you have an uh, internal learning, learning uh, training program with eight sessions. Uh, and you had uh, around uh, 30 cities from around the world, cities in our group, but also other cities, Eclay. You know, local government for sustainability is one of our partners also organize these uh, uh, training sessions for cities that are interested in this topic, so a lot of interest in the cities. And also, so say, if you could, if you could wrap up in, in one or two minutes, that would be great. Okay, thank you. And other initiatives, well, thank you, we finalized this also have because of COVID, you had this with MIT collab, you organized the post COVID city using green and blue infrastructure. And also have, uh, you know, when it's possible in the beginning, this uh, 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 what's called uh, in-person meetings, and several of our, our presentations in, in conference with cities, and also uh, short articles. And you also got this take further grant, GoFwen. That's another project with Glocool, and then you use this extra funded to pair the cities and cities to learn from each other. And here we have academic publications that they mentioned. And the next step is basically you're going to present in these three events. Our project ends in August uh, this year. And then we have uh, ICLE World calling us. You send us a proposal even with GPI Urban Europe to World Urban Forum and also CBD COP. And you're planning for the future to have new projects. You know, our partners, you would see opportunities for funding a follow up project. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, and I go back to the chair. Thank you, Jose. Actually, you had now 10 seconds to go. <laughs> Great. Um, it's, it's, um, no, no, it, it's really good. Thanks a lot. Um, and um, I, I just forgot to say that I, I, I was thinking about uh, having signs or something, but and then we realized maybe Johannes is the ones who will be the aggressive uh, reminder of, of timing. Uh, but do we have any just quick questions on clarifications or anything such? Nothing, no, no. Okay, because then we could... Um, oh, there is a hand raised, sorry, Pia. Um, a question, perhaps I missed something, but could you say what kind of civil society groups you involve there more concretely? I would be curious to know. Uh, you know, our main partner in the project is ICLE, a local government for sustainability. And then our main focus was local governments. Uh, but within this process, you, you, you learn how and also interview some civil society groups that uh, uh, help in innovations. But most of the innovations were led by local governments. Uh, and there are a lot of participation. Civil society consider civil society external source of learning. And you saw this make a big difference. Sometimes you have civil society involved in the, in the learning process for, for GBI, but you did not focus on specific and understand the role of civil society. Great, thanks. Um, shall we move on to the cinematic 
feature of today. Pia, please go ahead with mm -hmm. the creating interfaces project. So it's a hybrid format. I hope it will work. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm Pierre Labonie, coordinator of the Creating Interfaces project. Um, we worked in with um, Living Labs in Wilmington Slopes Toolchart, but um, as you said, um, I want to show a video because like this, you, it's not only me who is talking, but the different partners can present their work. And ah, and now I have to do. Mm, optimize for video, and I hope it should work. Hmm. No. When you share the video, we have to choose that you want to share the sound as well. Mm -hmm. I, to, I did for uh, for video clip optimian optimize for video clip. Oh no, I tested it and it worked. Why don't I get sound? The goal of the inter and transdisciplinary Suchi Nexus project creating interfaces is capacity. Sorry, that was wrong. The goal of the inter and transdisciplinary Suchi Nexus project creating interfaces is capacity building regarding knowledge co creation and participation in urban food, water, energy nexus governance and research. We work with three urban living labs in Poland, Romania, and US, both with citizens and local stakeholders like city administration or from local economy. The complexity and abstract nature of the topic presents the main challenge. Strategies to address this are, for example, the co-creation of visualizations and the approach of the project to tackle the food, water, energy nexus interlinkages from one starting point, interesting for the local stakeholders, and to connect to the other elements. In this video, we give you an impression of the process and the results of the Creating Interfaces project. At the center of nexus approach are the physical connections between food, water, and energy systems in cities, as well as interactions among the stakeholders who represent them. In our project, we explore these connections on multiple levels. We study geography and governance of each system and work with communities to identify a potential for implementing Nexus at the local level. And to make the Nexus concept more visible, we use text, images, and spatial data to develop story maps and other interactive uh, visualization tools. In SOAPS, we focus on the topic of food in educational institutions, especially in kindergartens. To work on the tool, we invited the directors of two kindergartens, parents and even children, who together with their parents evaluated the meals. The tool helped us to gather information of the meals served in kindergartens, the composition, allergens, origin of products. We also try to show what the environmental footprint on food in kindergarten is. For many products, we managed to show the water footprint and the CO2 footprint of transport. This data is a good start for discussion about more sustainable food in public catering. We started as a focal point with Zagan Lake, a lake situated in the east part of the city and where water is used also by inhabitants and in agriculture for irrigation. We developed a tool based on the food mileage principle and after interviews and uh, using uh, ULL uh, approaches we, we populated the map with, with uh, local producers from Tulcea city and uh, nearby um, localities. Here you can see a local producer and when you click on it you find information regarding the main products where you can find him on the map 
and where he has the sale point. In Wilmington, we focused on the issue of food waste. Nearly 40% of the material sent to the local landfill is from food or other organic material. Both the local Solid Waste Authority and the Environmental Protection Agency are both interested in reducing food waste. We're looking at citizens' acceptability for alternative disposal methods like using in-sink grinders, composting, or anaerobic digestion technology. Visualizations are present in most of the literature and research on food, energy, and water nexus. However, they are often quite abstract and complex, and therefore they are difficult to relate to, and people may be overwhelmed by them. This is why we asked ourselves, can a visualization process help connect people to the food, water, energy nexus to change behavior? The following diagram shows the process that we implemented with partners and stakeholders. It started with a series of workshops aimed to set the foundations. This is acquiring data literacy and setting a narrative. The next part consisted of an iterative development based on agile de development process in which we defined a series of weekly workshops aimed to define the needs, develop a solution and test it. They were repeated until a series of minimal viable product was achieved. That final prototype was presented and assessed during an urban living lab in which participants were asked to perform a series of tasks in a sequence that led to further discussion. As a result, participants acknowledge having discovered concrete ways in which their choices have a direct impact in food, energy and water. Okay, <clears throat> I don't know if I need to change the, just put this, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, I seem so alone somehow. Um, <laughs> so, um, just short uh, final words or um, some slides. Um, Regarding perspectives, um, we have still some ongoing work on policy recommendations, on um, connecting the food, water, energy nexus concept to urban resilience. Um, there is still ongoing exchange with local administrations and organizations, um, ongoing publications, and we would be interested in further projects because there are a lot of uh, things that somehow we could build in and questions that stay open. So for at this point, it's um, yeah, it's interesting to talk about impacts. It will be a topic tomorrow, but um, I think that's really an important point now. Um, so that were the impacts uh, we yeah we started with. We defined at the beginning at the local level we wanted to raise awareness and knowledge, foster networking, visibility. Um, like visibility of initiatives, but also visibility of the um, nexus connections. Then to initiate and develop further local knowledge, co-creation and participation, integrate the food, water, energy nexus concept into local governance. And for research, it was about the advancement of knowledge on the urban nexus to increase openness of research, um, also about better science communication, about translating complex concepts and the advancement of inter and transdisciplinary research. Um, so it's about capacity building in cities and cross-sector um, governance, as well as in science. And um, yes, we hope for changes in thinking and practice at the end. Mm. Yes, last autumn we had the workshop around this, uh, like uh, relating to this concept of a theory of change concept or impact uh, logics. Um, around outputs, outcomes, and impacts. Um, I will not go into detail, just as an example. I think um, like one output is the, this uh, co-created data and communication tool and the nexus visualizations. Concrete outcomes of this are that um, local producers can inform on their products, um, local consumers can easier choose to buy local and get information on, on the impacts of buying local. Um, it's we created visibility of the food water energy nexus and help to understand it. 
um, where we concrete parents know what their children get to eat in their kindergartens, including environmental impacts. Um, but also we brought people together, we created connections and initiated discourses and cooperation. So we hope there will be some initiatives going on. Um, regarding impacts, which is not in our direct reach, but we hope, yeah, this can be a, perhaps initiated or, yeah. Um, yeah, firstly, there's experiences with co-creation, urban living labs, participation. I think it's important to have these experiences for achieving change to local governance, for empowering people, for encouraging others. So you need good examples and to see that it works and what can be done. Um, then this increased transparency and quality and impact of food, um, for example, here in public institutions, we hope that parents will monitor food quality more strongly because they, it's easier to do it and they have um, more conscience on this. Um, this drives institutions to improve food because they see they're confronted with requests. It's more in the, in the minds of people, um, also when they choose the kindergartens perhaps, so at the end, um, this transparency can lead to more um, yeah, requests for local um, sustainable food products and at the end have also environmental effects. We have and on health, for example. So that's just an example for making it more concrete. Pia, um, your time is already up. Ah, sorry, then I leave the policy recommendations and Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, of course, you had some troubles with the starting, but I guess we can always we can perhaps come back to recommendations as well if we want to, if uh, we have questions. Um, thanks a lot. Now, Michelle, you are up as the uh, the spokesperson for urbanizing in place today. Even if we have Chiara here as well. Um, please go ahead. You see, you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So good afternoon. My uh, name is uh, Michiel De Hane and with Chiara Tornagi, who's also here, uh, I've been leading the Urbanizing in Place um, project. Um, a project we developed with a consortium of uh, 10 partners in total uh, in response to a call we all uh, responded to on the food, water, energy nexus. And our aim was to get the food water nexus out of the black box and to advance uh, a political ecology perspective on urban uh, metabolic uh, cycles. The starting point of our proposal was uh, relatively simple, namely uh, that in order to put together water, energy and food in a virtuous, sustainable, equitable and ecological way, that it is necessary to, to develop the concrete practices that can begin to do that. And so we thought we uh, know such a set of uh, practices, uh, namely agroecological food growing, but it is not exactly a practice uh, that finds in the city, in an urban society, the conditions through which it can uh, thrive. And this led us to rather fundamental questions such as, uh, why is it that urban communities fail to care for their own socio-ecological uh, metabolism? Why is it that there is no place in urbanizing societies for a virtuous practice like agroecology, and more particular for agroecological farmers as stewards of the food, water, energy nexus? And eventually, uh, how can we turn that around and how can urbanism become soil caring and food enabling? Um, to imagine such an agroecological food enabling urbanism, uh, we had to face, sorry, um, three key challenges namely the ongoing destruction of agricultural land and infrastructure, which is literally the turning over of farmland to urban land use, but also the inadequate use of farmland and the rapid loss of farmers in an urbanizing environment. Second, the mismanagement of soils, which in an agroecological perspective, soils then can be looked at as proxy of the nexus, as the binding elements in the multiple metabolisms through which nutrients, water and energy are transformed within agroecological practices, 
in the pursuit of virtuous relations between healthy soils, healthy plants, and healthy people. And third, the epistemic, uh, epistemic social, and political gap between the agroecological movement and urban food communities, which uh, reflect the historical, physical, and mental and political separation between town and country. Um, this last point has gained weight over the uh, course of the project, uh, uh, coming forward as um, perhaps one of the hardest barriers to overcome in order to translate the insights of this project into real impact on the ground. It is one of the reasons why in the original design uh, of the project, we placed an international forum on an agroecological urbanism in the center of the project, and why we have invested a lot of energy in the tail end of the project to render the findings of, uh, to render our findings intelligent, intelligible, sorry, for uh, this mixed and internally divided community in the form of uh, an online incubator, an online resource for an agroecological urbanism. I will be showing you how we have uh, structured that uh, resource, uh, which I had hoped would be fully finished by now, but which we are still in the process of uh, editing and completing, but which is uh, far uh, advanced. Um, the online resource tries to bring into conversation communities of practice engaged in political agroecology and groups engaged in sustainable food planning. The resource tries to systematize the experience of the past four years, uh, defining on the one hand concrete entries into this conversation, as well as areas of articulation, which we have identified as key areas of work in bringing, out, uh, bringing about enabling conditions for uh, agroecological stewardship of the urban environment. The resource opens with 13 uh, conversation stoppers that uh, set the context and illustrate why further dialogue at the intersection of agroecology and urban policy making is needed. And it takes that in uh, to eight building blocks, eight compl uh, complementary directions in which this conversation can be uh, taken. And on a third layer, it demonstrates what this conversation has yielded so far in the four contexts in which we have been uh, working. The content of each of these uh, levels or layers is always illustrated through tagged items that can be consulted as uh, floating uh, content in multiple places in the resource. And here an illustration of uh, how a conversation stopper leads you to the conflict between housing and agriculture and to a building block on the productive housing estate that addresses the relationship between the right to grow and the right to uh, shelter. The 80, uh, eight building blocks then are a way of speaking about a reality that as of today only exists in fragmented form. And the blocks try to name missing relations, missing areas of articulation that identify ways in which urban conditions could be transformed in order to build a supportive context for agroecological food uh, production and for agroecological farmers. They look at territorial conditions of land access and proximity, at value constellations, at enabling infrastructures and at transformative uh, pedagogies. Um, the blocks or specific aspects of the blocks have been then uh, also used to uh, describe and systematize the strategizing work that took form in the four uh, local platforms. In Rosario, Rosario, we have worked with a team with an impressive track record, which was in, uh, internationally recognized last year with the prestigious Prize for Cities awarded by the World Resource Institute. And the strategizing work in Rosario was uh, rather comprehensive in nature and demonstrates what can uh, be achieved through uh, the work of a multidisciplinary team within uh, an urban administration, feeding an agroecological agenda in multiple lines of public policy. Uh, such as health regulation and uh, general municipal ordinances, land use planning, infrastructure provision, training and facilitation, collaboration with the parks department uh, and the solid waste management department. In London, uh, shared assets uh, teamed up with uh, London Capital Growth, with Sustain and the Land Workers Alliance to build an agenda around fridge farming, fringe farming, sorry, and brought this agenda in a follow-up exercise to Bristol, Sheffield, and Glasgow, putting uh, uh, agroecology in, uh, on a national policymaking uh, agenda. The exercise with uh, Quantum Waste, a private innovator in uh, solid waste management, also in London, aimed at uh, building a quantum farm 
where the compost of the organic waste stream of the company would be used to uh, grow food. Well, this exercise um, failed as uh, the company also failed to obtain a planning permit. Um, but this uh, failure was uh, documented and shows concrete obstacles in local planning and a strong resistance to accept on-farm composting activities within uh, the London Green Belt. Uh, the research on nutrient recovery and composting was uh, subsequently also taken into the Soil Nexus project funded through uh, Take It Further, Pegasus Grant uh, of Future Earth. In Brussels, uh, we worked with the uh, policy community active within the Good Food Strategy and the Boeren Bruxelles Paysan project, highlight highlighting the role of agroecologists that uh, can act as intermediaries between the context of the farm and the urban context they are part of. And we contributed to the policy process that works towards the establishment of a center for urban agroecology modeled after the Rosario experience. The team in Riga engaged with the diverse reality of alternative food networks that exist both in the form of traditional, often family-based combinations of self-growing and food exchange, as well as recent imp more imported initiatives of box schemes, direct buying communities, and by local uh, initiatives. The product, uh, project identified strategies to value this diversity, including the revaluation of existing infrastructure and garden complexes that still exist within the fabric of uh, the city. Um, to take uh, the resource uh, and the lessons wrapped up in it uh, further afield and to further populate the resource, we will be launching an ideas competition for which we managed to secure some funds. Cities will be challenged to develop concrete strategies around the missing links and areas of policy articulation we have described in uh, the building blocks. And the resource uh, obviously also functions as an uh, archive to uh, store some of more uh, classical uh, academic outputs, as well as to policy briefs and uh, policy recommendation exercises uh, that we are in the process again of uh, completing. And I would like to conclude by uh, thanking all our partners and also all our uh, funders for the collaboration of the past uh, four years. Great, thank you. Perfectly timed too, 10, ten oh. seconds left. And we have something <laughs> else here, a Word document. Oh, sorry, that's uh, not the idea. That's not uh, sensible. Um, uh, I mean, sensitive material. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> How do I stop sharing? Just stop sharing on the top. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Look, now you, Are know, we recording it now you know it all. Yeah, yeah we can go back. Look at that. <laughs> it's okay. So, um, as I also realized, um, I'm terribly sorry, I forgot to ask if there were any questions for clarifications for, for creating interfaces, but quickly urbanizing in place, any clarifying questions for clarification? And then also, I think you can address Pia if you want to, for creating interfaces. No. Well, if we just open widely to the floor, I mean, this, of course, this categorization is a bit on our behalf, uh, speaking now as JPA Urban Europe or my former workplace, so to speak, uh, and the ECIID, the, the, the ex expert committee for innovation and, hmm, sorry, forgot what that was. Um, but we've been looking at the project quite a bit in this committee uh, and um, uh, we thought that, well, one heading for this group would be something around capacity building. Of course, circularity goes for, for most of the projects in different ways, of course, maybe. Uh, but but, but ca thinking about capacity building in, in your three projects, if I'm just opening with this question, um, do, do, you, do you think, and thinking, of course, uh, impacts that we are really interested in, how, how would you say, did, did, are, are you, I wouldn't say satisfied, but are you okay? Where do you want to go on with it? I, I saw some of you presented something of that, but is there anything more you would like to say about that? Capacity building in specific, specifically? Yes, Michelle? 
Well, I think um, one of the things we, I think, try to address is a bit the question of whose capacity are we building in uh, in urban environments, yeah? and uh, especially because when we're talking uh, agroecology, we're talking about communities that are traditionally simply not part of the urban constituency uh, and are not seen or uh, uh, in many instances uh, um, disabled or actually whose capacity I think is, is often reduced in an, uh, in an urban environment. And I guess what we've been trying to do, and I'm not saying successfully across the board, but is trying to take some of these sens sensibilities into um, an urban policy environment and then trying to see where where we can on some level break into uh, some of the institutional capacities that exist and, and try to capture some some of these uh, or really identify areas where there are actually uh, areas of work where that that uh, uh, cities could pursue much more systematically and, and could actually positively affect uh, those uh, uh, communities that in in our mind could actually be much more their allies than uh, than uh, what is uh, what is happening on the ground today. Yes. Oh, Chiara. If I can just briefly add, um, we have been really like as the the project are approaching science, we have been thinking what's next, like how to take this work further, and yeah, how to uh, to to build capacities, but also how to bridge community so we felt over the years that our project was really an in you know working in between two two different worlds and we often found ourselves struggling to 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 find the right pitch in the way that you know you are pitching the urban community you are pitching the rural community you're pitching you're working in a space where there is skepticism there is misunderstanding and so our you know decision on what kind of outputs prepared to produce so then we're working also on a further animation we are working a lot with visuals and we you know it's part of a conversation that we haven't yet haven't finished but really how you know to produce that change is very much the work we want to spend doing in the next year um, with the resources we can find and uh, i think it is an ongoing challenge for sure and experiment with alternative, you know, to the usual academic outputs, I think is is uh, crucial. Thanks. So if if I uh, quickly, uh, one could say that uh, bridge building between communities, for example, is also a way of, of raising awareness. Or as you would, uh, perhaps there are also communities that are in need of that. But I, I was thinking for the other two, uh, creating interfaces and for if when, Pia and, and Jose, that, that thing about bridging communities, is that something that you've also seen as a crucial aspect, as a capacity building aspects perhaps? Yes, you know, in many of the innovations actually mentioned in my in our work, you, 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 uh, you realize that this um, cooperation between, uh, so in many cases, integration between sectors were able to bring resources and, and, and innovate with sources internal from the city, but many times were able to also to, through this integration between sectors in the city government, that was our client, you know, and, and get uh, resources from outside. Uh, I just saw how to also help to scale up a lot of these initiatives. Just to give you an example, a city in Brazil, Florianópolis in the South, there was one of the 10 cases. They started with a uh, uh, composting that it was an informal settlement. They didn't have waste management. They started a compost initiative, very local. And, and later on, these, they start doing urban agriculture because they have all this compost and no one wanted and they tried to do it. And later on, become a city, one of the members became city council member and he spent this initiative to the whole city with the, the Department of Health because it also could teach nutrition and, and also in the, in the integrated because this health and education in our case of Brazil, they have much more resources than uh, this other environmental uh, management departments. With this, they could scale up, and now they have four in 400 places around the city, the initiative. But it's not only waste, but it's waste, urban agriculture, and education, and health. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Pia. Um, yes, bridging communities was a main um, goal and a main activity. One concrete aspect is that relates perhaps more to the question before is, um, but it's also bridging. It's about this accessibility of data, because you asked what this this was an important point regarding um, further um, yeah further work. Um, in, in all cities, there were different um, aspects around bridging communities. Perhaps Andrea could um, add on Wilmington. I found really interesting there that there were a lot of initiatives and there was the need to of this visibility, visibility of the different initiatives. And then also for all, I think it's important to um, connect this nexus aspect to other commitments, like um, connecting to um, work on, on resilience, um, resilience on, on the SDGs. So you have a lot of things going on that is not well connected to each other. I think that's also an aspect about um, connecting communities. But there are a lot of aspects around this. All right, thanks. So in a way, the, the, the food, water, energy nexus was surprising in that it started connecting a lot more than just food, water, energy, so to speak. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm putting it out there for all of you. We saw a lot of connections of health, health and education uh, in those initiatives. They were not exactly nexus, uh, you know, intervention to improve nexus or more green, blue infrastructure that generate nexus impacts. And you saw a lot of, um, uh, and one of the reasons I just mentioned in general, those that have much larger departments, they have much larger impacts, and they are very interested in these more innovative way to, you know, disseminate some of the key policies they have, like nutrition. They found it very interesting to urban agriculture to spread nutrition. You saw in Johannesburg, an uh, initiative with uh, school gardens that involve uh, schools the teachers and, and, and also the community around. And they thought it was a good way also to integrate education with community management and also give skills to, to the people in the, those communities to you know, work in agriculture, but also some other kind of uh, jobs they got in these that could work in houses and this. And they found very interesting that how those departments outside the environment or uh, food, they were very interested in, in kind of uh, uh, getting these as, as, as part of the, the policy as well, particularly health and education. So many innovations in, that had this health and education involved. Maybe we can add something more on the, you know, the health aspect and the soil. Uh, Michiel explained that in his presentation. Um, so an agroecological perspective talks about the healthy soil, healthy plant and healthy people. And we found, especially when we were in Argentina, talking with the health practitioners that were part of, uh, of the agroecology coalitions there, really very effectively explaining through the understanding of, of uh, plant secondary metabolites, really how a plant become nutrition and, and in, increases health of people depending on the soil conditions depending on so really this idea of everything connected and how plants soil and people connect was very very powerful very well uh, illustrated so uh, in terms of capacity building and going beyond the food water energy next i think it was really great to have people from different backgrounds uh, engaging in these conversations and uh, and and really building the understanding in on site through uh, through that, this way of uh, exemplifying concepts, and um, so I would say that has been crucial learning for our project. And then, if I can add another point of capacity building, uh, we think that bringing people from the Brussels context to uh, to the Argentinian context has been uh, so and. 10, 15 days full immersion 
to see how uh, different actors coordinate has been crucial in what happened later in, in Brussels. So maybe looking ahead for future funding, having more resources to enable practitioners to exchange for a certain period of time and to ex experience um, other contexts is important for, for a full understanding of, of, uh, of uh, what is possible to do and, uh, and why certain uh, things work in a certain context. Yes, I, I, I do have a follow-up question on that, but we have a hand raised. Sorry. Yes, it's uh, Ulrich. Uh, I'm, I'm actually working or have worked in another project on waste fuel uh, ULL, um, but I'm, I'm very much interested in food. And I think one of the things I reflected now is obviously the call was about connecting um, energy and water to food. And in some way, it's like a physical connection, you know, it's energy and water is more physical. But I think food as a nexus. You know, I always felt that even in our project, we followed the guidelines of energy and waste, uh, so to speak, but um, and water. But it is actually much more, food is more connected to, to social things like um, health, as we said that already, education, uh, and also po political understanding. So, so it, maybe it is something where we could say, one should ask rather which what things do you want to nexus food with instead of giving a, a fixed box of the two other things? Uh, yeah, so that's just my reflection. In terms of future funding, you know, that's a thing. A bit. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing. <laughs> Because I think they want us also to feed back in a bit, you know, what, what should the next the next call be and where, where we, do we need to go next? Yes, it's quite interesting that, that uh, turning it a bit, what do you want to nexus? That's an mm -hmm. interesting way of, of using the urban nexus as we might see in, in uh, at least in a European setting in the programming, uh, even though it's a bit out of my hands. I think Pia raised her hand, yes? Yes, I just wanted to add that we also found that people could relate much more, much easier to this food aspects. We, mm. we started with all the three elements somehow, but finally came to have food at the core in each of our urban living labs, because it's it was really important to, to relate to needs and really questions like on health. But then I found it really helpful for bridging to the concept, really to come from food and then um, like, work on the interconnections. I think it worked well, but to come with the whole thing was really difficult. Yes. I'm, I'm trying to see if there's anyone who, who wants to say something now. Uh, that, that was actually one of my, fault, no, not mine, but, but I'm happy that you actually breached that sense of in, in all three of these projects uh many times it seems like food was one a bit more a trigger for for communities local communities and, and outside let's say formal city administrations etc uh, no you're shaking your head Chiara. <laughs> I don't know, I would say soil was more for us, but maybe okay. because of the, the communities we engaged. Maybe except maybe different in the Latvian context, but I would say surely London and Rosario were soil. But we, we struggled for a while in terms of if you really think about the nexus and, and more in terms of like also what circulates and trying to really think about uh, metabolic perspective. Yeah, then food is of a very different nature. No, I mean, water and energy you can really subject to an understanding of flow, and then it's more the nutrients maybe that uh, that circulate. So we had a while where we were thinking nutrient water energy uh, nexus mm. and how that then comes together, of course, in food production systems and in, in in communities that are ultimately engaging with this with food, and then the fundamental connection to soil care as something that is maybe yeah crucial to to actually. Um, uh, have an environment in which uh, food, water, and energy can can uh, nutrients, water, and energy can intersect. 
but uh, yeah it's i think it's it's something that that shifted on some uh, on some level and and i i also like this question on what to next is because i think we were trying to really think about um that nexus uh, approach as, as something that requires work and care and, and is not uh, an automatic effect from some sort of nature-based solution, but something that actually needs, needs uh, mobilization needs to be taken care of, especially in urban environments where, where that uh, nexus is often in, in, in troubled states. Huh? Yeah, Jose? No, I just say a lot of places is particularly in, in informal way, informal settlements, is the way people see to get income. And it's why urban yeah. agriculture a lot. You want to think about nexus, you cannot get much money in selling water or energy. And people engage in these voluntarily because where they can get income. But I think you've ending now and you can maybe discuss this this later. Thank